cannot have ever been a more uh, definitive, exhaustive work of musical scholarship, although it's much more than that, cultural, historical scholarship, than uh, the first volume of Mark Lewison's projected... Uh, well, I said projected, he's going to do them. The three-volume history of the Beatles all these years. Volume one, tune-in, is out now in two different versions. Mark is with us now. Hello, Mark. <coughs> Hi, Stuart. Hi, Mark. How are you doing, Mark? Yeah. Um, did you think when you started it, I mean, obviously, there was a lot to get in. Yeah. Did you think it was going to be as extensive as it's turning out to be? I mean, you, have, you were telling us you've got work planned for the second and third volumes which would take you to about 2028, 20, you think? Something like that, yeah. Uh, I didn't quite know how long it would take. I thought 12 years, maybe, for all three. Yeah. But the first one took 10, and it came out last year. And I'm yeah. now working on volumes two and three, but... Yeah. Yeah, it's going to take a very long time. Let's just quickly sketch in for people who don't know. You've been for many years like a, a preeminent British foremost Beatle authority. How did how did that start? Just from being a childhood fan? Yeah, 1963. I was five years old. I heard, let's say she loves you. It might have been please, please me. It's all getting a bit vague now. <laughs> but I heard it and I was just like captivated with it. You know, it just sounded wonderful. It sounded exciting and interesting and fresh. And, and I was hooked. Yeah. And I've been hooked ever since. And you wrote a, be a, a, a Chronicle of the Beatles Live performances. Uh, yeah. Yes, I did. And that came out in 1986. And that led to me being commissioned by EMI to go into Abbey Road and listen to all the tapes wow. and write about the sessions, which was... Which was the famous the Beatles, big, big, big Beatles sessions book, which is an extraordinary thing. And then, yeah. so, but this particular, had this always been simmering in the back of your brain somewhere? No, in fact, when that book came out, I was over in New York with my American editor and he said, you should write a biography of the Beatles. And I was like 28, 29 years old. And I just didn't feel that I had enough experience uh, yeah. as a writer and also in life to actually know to write about other people's lives in, in any kind of authoritative way. So um, it was only really when I wrote a biography of Benny Hill, which was about 15, uh, 12 years ago, that I realised I could write biography. And as soon as I knew that, I knew that what I had to do, I had to go back to the Beatles and write their story while it was possible, while all the witnesses are still alive. Yeah, let's just make this point, because this is part one, which goes up to December the 31st, 1962. Yes. So the level of detail, if you've seen <laughs> the book, is incredible. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so you, this yeah. is 800 odd pages to get this, to 1962. Yeah, and I've That's 900, 900 pages. 900 odd pages. Nine, yeah, and yeah. there is this other edition that, which is that more, Stuart referred to, yeah. which is 1,700 pages. <laughs> right. And it still only goes up to 62. But I've heard, you know, I've heard you say, I heard you talk about this at the Lamb Festival, that you said that you, one of your motivating reasons was this, this will never be done again. Yeah, yeah, it's never been done this thoroughly before. No rock band has ever been written about this thoroughly before. No. Um, and it needs to be done now because the witnesses, most of them are still with us, not all of them. Um, and also I've got access and have had access to documents and documents are at the root of this book. It's a very factual history. Yeah. Uh, now, if I wrote that kind of level of detail... But it reads detail, like a novel. It, well, it does. It has a narrative drive that yeah, carries you on. Yeah. Well, it does because the lives of these people were just so extraordinary. I mean, they yeah. were the biggest band of all time and they have the best story of all time, yeah, by yeah. far. Yeah. What uh, was full what, of the most extraordinary people. Were they always cooperative? You know, did, did you always get what you wanted from the people at the centre of this story as much as possible, the ones who were around? Uh, well, this book is not authorised. That's the yeah. first thing to say. Right. So the, uh, the, the, the chief protagonists haven't cooperated. However, I've had access in the past because I have worked for them for many years. Not at the moment, but I have done. Mm. So I've had access. Most of the people I wanted to see, pretty much everybody I did see, uh, and I've also, it's not just about what people say to me, it's anytime anybody's ever said anything to anyone, yeah. I'll use it and I'll say where it comes from. So the notes at the back of the book tell you all the attributions for every, every quote. I just want to give a little example of when I heard you talk about this before, about the, 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 the level of detail, and, I, and this made me think, this is funny, you, got a, you wanted to get a, a copy of the floor plan of the van. What was the type of van that they used to hang around in in the early days? Um, I think you're talking about when they first went to Hamburg. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they were driven to Hamburg the first time by a fantastic entrepreneur in Liverpool called Alan Williams, yeah. uh, who was the Beatles' first manager. And if he hadn't have taken the Beatles to Hamburg, none of this would have happened. Yeah. He really is a vital cog in the wheel. And he drove them there, which is about well, 1,200 miles, I think, something like that. It's well, a huge journey. Anyway, I do say in the book how far it is. Um, and they were crammed in the van with all their gear, the amps, the guitars, the drums, various other people as well. 
And I just wanted to, well, what kind of van was it? So there was one photograph of the van. So I got a mate of mine who's a van expert. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what van it was. And then it's very simple these days. I mean, I was writing books pre-internet, yeah. but of course these days it's much easier. Typed in the name of the van uh, into Google and I got pictures of the van, including its inside. So I could see that they were having to sit kind of, all the people in the van were sitting down the, the, down the side. So like bench it, seats. It, bench like, seats, yeah. yeah, with the luggage in between them. And it was right. really uncomfortable. Yeah. And it just helps me to, yeah. it's not that I'm a van nerd. It's just that <laughs> I've got to write this and I want to make it as colourful as possible for the reader. So I want to describe what it was like for them in that van. Well, they were well, just scrunched in like that, it's, looking it's, at each other. It's fascinating the way you put this together and your, the way your life has been shaped by this project and will be for the foreseeable future. Mm. Um, but obviously we want to talk about some of the many thousands of stories in here. We're going to play I Saw Her Standing There and um, uh, you think you've sort of uncovered the real story of the writing of this? Yeah, it's actually a story that Paul never tells. There's a great photograph by Paul's brother Mike of Paul and John sitting in the fire, uh, sitting with their feet on the fireplace in the front parlour of Paul's house in Liverpool in Allerton, now National Trust property. Mm. Yes. But there's a bigger story which is that actually right around the time Love Me Do came out, in fact, the same week it got into the NME chart, which was a major moment in their lives. Um, Paul did a... They had two days off. I mean, they never had days off, really, these guys, but they had two days off, and Paul had a lovely girlfriend from the art school called, called Celia, and they decided to hitchhike down to London to go to the Establishment Club, which was Peter Cook's wow. club yeah. in Soho. Yeah. And they stopped at Watford Gap, and they got eventually they got to the Establishment Club, and they danced through the night, and they kipped on the floor in um, Paul's friend's apartment on Great Portland Street, which is another interesting story. Uh, and the next day, as they're walking around London, they're coming up with the words for I saw her standing there. And uh, on Fitzroy Square, Celia remembers, which is a lovely square in London. And yeah. now when I walk through it, I'm thinking, yeah, they wrote that here. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and the, the flat in Great Portland Street, I was like, well, do you remember? I said to Celia, do you remember what number it was? As if she would, and of course she didn't. Um, and so it was Paul's friend Ivan's. I got in touch with Ivan's widow and she didn't remember either. But I thought, I'll just do one more thing. And I checked the electoral registers. Everything is in a library somewhere if you know where to look. Right. And when I checked the electoral registers, I found out where Paul's friend Ivan Vaughan was sharing this flat in Great Portland Street. And it was the very same building where George Martin had been for oboe lessons from Jane Asher's mother. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a coincidence. About 15 years earlier. And these coincidences, they pepper the book yeah. and they pepper this story. And without any of them happening, or without even one of them happening, the thing would have fallen down. Right. That's incredible. It's a great story. You know, when you talk about that and the Beatles first going to London, uh, you, you also write very vividly about the reception they received when they first yes. spent time in London, which yeah. is not good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I immersed myself in all things Beatles, and they, when they were famous and they toured the world, everywhere they went, they would do a press conference. And depending on what was on their mind that particular day, all sorts of stories come up. Um, in, there was a time in Australia in 64 when they were all talking about how they'd come down to London the first time and everyone had been rude to them and ignored them and told them, you'll never make it from Liverpool, you'll never make it from the north. So, uh, and I thought, well, for me, that's like, well, I've got to put that in 62, mm. not in 64. Mm. And I managed to find out all about it. And they came down to London to plug Love Me Do, to play... Love Me Do on Radio Luxembourg, miming, would you believe, without instruments. Their first ever <laughs> <laughs> radio session in London was miming without instruments, wow. which is a fantastically surreal on the radio. Yeah. So, on the radio. so what they, they like they radio darts. They would right. be miming to their record, and, <laughs> right. and then uh, people would applaud, and then they'd yeah. say a few words, and that would be a wow. plug. Right. Wow. Um, anyway, while they were down, they were taken around town by Tony Calder, who eventually formed Immediate Records and with right. Andrew Lou Goldham. Um, big man of the record business for a very long time. And he told me all about what, it, what happened when he took them around. Uh, and basically everyone was slamming doors in their faces and being really downright rude to them. In particular, they went to a magazine called Pop Weekly, which was a dreadful little weekly glossy magazine mm. that Robert Stigwood used to publish. Ah, uh, on to the Bee Gees and all that. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is before he went bankrupt yeah. and then revived yeah. himself. Yeah. And um, the... the 
they were meant to see Robert Stigwood and Robert Stigwood decided he wouldn't see them after all. And they held that against him. Today. And it bounced back in a big way for Stigwood four years later when he was in with a chance of managing them after Brian Epstein died. And also that day, John, the, John led the Beatles out of an interview because he, he couldn't take this guy's insulting questions anymore. And, it was, and in so doing, uh, Sigwood used to make these plaster casts of his young male singers, um, very few of whom anyone would have ever heard. This is all pre-Beatles, early, sure. early British yeah. pop, that kind of mentality. Yeah. Uh, and as John got up, he, he pulled the edge of the table up and one of these plaster casts broke. And it was a symbolic moment because it was like the old days of pop were, yeah. were, were, were breaking yeah. and the new, the new wave was coming in, which was the Beatles. If, I mean, I didn't, I had no idea at all about the GA page three till reading your, your book. They were, John, Paul and George is a trio. Yes. If that tape that they made, <laughs> a, a gentleman who I think he'd bought his tape recorded with his compensation money from a motorcycle accident. Is, is that, that right? right? While he was in the RAS. Well, he was in the, and yes, he became a kind of surrogate service. manager. Yes, for a while. yes, Derek Hodkin. Could you possibly put a figure on how much that tape would be worth? Oh, my no. goodness. It, it, millions? Um, millions? Well, Maybe it, not that. But. Well, millions can only be recouped from commercial you know, from yeah, the commercial yeah. products. And I, it probably would have been fairly low fi but its value to history would have been, been immense. immense. Yeah, absolutely immense. Yeah, yeah. But he, he I've seen the tape. <gasps> he taped over it with <laughs> something on the third programme in 1959. <laughs> he really oh, liked no. classical music. He didn't like this pop stuff. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, J Page 3. Do you ever a day goes by? When he doesn't regret doing that. Oh, I think he's moved on. Oh, do you think? No. Then. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I think he laughs at it. You've got to, really. You've got to, you? really, haven't you? Yeah. Another thing that's fascinating about it is, like, you know, we, we're saying, you know, if this didn't happen, then this story would not have existed. And, yes. you know, the, the other thing that springs up from the book is, is how many times, actually, they nearly jacked they nearly it in jacked it. in oh, the yeah. early days. You know, the, the, you say 1960 and 61, and also when Pete Best was, was hired, that's nearly the end of the group as well. Well, it wasn't really. What that was was a technicality in that... Um, um, they wanted to sack Pete for a long time. Um, eventually, they, when they got a manager, Brian Epstein, they said to Brian, oh, you do it. Right. Because that's the manager's job. They, yeah. they were too cowardly to do it. So um, the, Brian had a contract with Pete, had to provide him with paid work. And a long story cut short, in order to um, get the Beatles out of the contract with Pete, they broke the group up and reformed immediately with Ringo. Right. Ah. So that one's only a technicality. A technicality but... but they had actually been on the edge of breaking up two or three times before then. There was a time in 1960 when John and Stuart, Stuart Sutcliffe, the bass player, and possibly George, um, suddenly chucked in the Beatles and went down to Hatch End near Pinner in Middlesex um, to hang out with Royston Ellis, who was Britain's first beat poet. He was our Alan Ginsberg. Oh, yes, like. yes, this is fascinating. And when they got all the way down the hatch end by, by train and by hitching a lift, um, he was out. <laughs> More than out, he was away, because Royston used to go wandering for periods of time, and his mum didn't know when he was coming back, so they went back up to Liverpool and carried on with the Beatles. <laughs> the beat poet living with the his mum. <laughs> well, you see, that's, yeah, well, one, yeah. that's one of the things I absolutely yeah. adore about the book. Clearly, it's a book about the Beatles, but it becomes, kind of more than that, it becomes a thing about British... Post-war history as well. Yeah, I didn't want to just tell the Beatles story. Yeah. They never existed in a vacuum. No. They were always part of everything that was going on around them and they were absorbing it and indeed they were changing it. So I have to show everything else that was happening as well and I have to tell the whole story of, the, of music. Yes. And how difficult, and how also the, the thing that's sort of worth reminding ourselves of is, um, uh, well, here's a bit of Mrs Mills. <laughs> I wish we'd play while we're talking. Uh, because um, uh, actually the American co record company were much keener on um, uh, releasing the records by the Beatles label mate, Mrs Mills and the Beatles. Yes, very um, For those who don't know, and most probably don't know, Mrs yeah. Mills was a large, round mm. lady, homely-looking lady, uh, who played the piano and that was it. But, yes. they, but they did put out Beatles records and to no great success for a while, didn't they? Yeah. Um, well, in America, the yeah. reason you're playing Mrs Mills is because I, it's, it's a great story is that um, when the Beatles release Love Me Do, EMI, their record company in England, sent it across to America to Capitol, which it owned, Capital, the great Capitol Records, Frank Sinatra and so on, Peggy Lee, and said, please release this. And in common with everything else that was they received from England, they said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> no way we're going to put out this northern English beat group with a harmonica yeah. sound. Uh, so they said, no. And in 1962, from hundreds of records that EMI sent them, they released six. <laughs> and one of them was Mrs Mills. 
Yeah, and it sold 72 <laughs> copies. Yeah, and I have one of the 72 wow. right here. Oh, there, there it is. Wow. Wow. The is it true that Mrs. Mills' piano is still in Abbey Road and the same yes, piano appeared is. on some Beatles records? Yes, I think it's on... I'm not Someone sure. Someone told me Hey Jude. Or... No, that, no, that's a Bechstein, I think. Oh, right, or something okay. like that. But anyway, it, it is right. on a Beatles well, record. Who like... was those 72 hipsters <laughs> in America? I want to know. <laughs> I've got one of them, so there are yeah. 71 other copies well, of this. It's... And I think we should we should put out an appeal. I think we probably should. It's an incredible book. It's it, incredible. It, it's I an mean, incredible book. That, you know, if you're interested in British post war history, the Beatles, everything, you should definitely read. And it does move along with the pace of a novel. It, it's not. It's not a dry and arid, you know, analytical work of history. It's a fantastically detailed indeed, sort of cultural so. tour de force. It really. is. It is. It really is. Thank uh, you. We're going to finish off with um, uh, some of the guy live at the BBC. Yes. Yes. Well, some other guy is um, one of the Beatles' strongest songs before they were famous. Richie Barrett is the original on London Atlantic. And they would press them, the Beatles would press themselves into the browseries, those little booths in record shops yes, that you used yes. to have. Uh, and they would all squeeze in and, and they'd get everything from America to be played for them. This yes. was in Brian Epstein's shop. Uh, and, and, and they would dis nems and they would decide what was good and what was crap. Yeah. Usually John will come up with the crap. We're not doing that one. Right. But some other guy was one that they loved completely. And John and Paul loved it so much they couldn't decide who would sing the lead vocal, so they sang it side by side. Wow. Right. And when the Beatles first were filmed by TV cameras by Granada in the cavern, they were doing some other guy. And it's just, it, they never recorded it for EMI, but there are recordings of it. And the one you're about to play is the BBC one, which is a great story in itself. Yeah. Go ask just quickly. I know that while you're up here as well, you're doing some research for future volumes. Give us a bit of a hint what you're looking into in the next few days. I'll, my, my line is I will go anywhere where there's something I can learn. Uh, and there's a place up in, in Chorley in Lancashire, a uh, memorabilia company called Trax, and they have. Incredible things pass through their hands. They buy and sell, yeah. and, and I, I get to see things while, they've got, while they're holding right. onto them before they sell. So, and I don't quite know what I'm going to okay. see, but I know I'll learn a lot, yeah. and Great. I always do. Great. Mm. Great to see you, Mark. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Mark. Yeah, all these years, the Beatles tune in. Mark Lewison.